All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ev Coleman, and I'm on staff at OneSource Center, and I want to thank you for attending today's session on ChatGBT. I know I'm looking forward to learning more about this tool that has been all over the news. Um, we are pleased to have today's presenters, Dr. Michael Jones and Annie Hugenberg from the University of Cincinnati's Office of Research. Um, and again, um, reminding everyone the session's being recorded and I will monitor the Zoom chat for any questions, but also feel free. Um, uh, Dr. Michael Jones mentioned that he would, uh, this is an interactive session, so feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Um, and with that, I'm happy to hand it over to our presenters today. Welcome. Thank you. Very glad to be here. And just to follow up on that, yes, this is very much designed to be an interactive session. I want to give you all the tools. If you're not already using ChatGPT, I want to give you the tools to start using it even later this morning after we get off. So feel free to raise your hand, probably the best way to do this in Zoom, and then you can be unmuted so we can um, answer all the questions that you have. So real briefly, I uh, want to just introduce why this is important, what it is, and then we're going to get straight into it. We're going to show you how you can use this tool to actually help you at work, help you uh, with, with fundraising, help you with marketing, help you with research, uh, help you with just general productivity. And then we're going to talk about some of the limitations, briefly discuss some advanced use cases. There's some pretty powerful tools out there that you may not be aware of, and then we'll close this with some open-ended discussion. So, so real briefly, who am I? My name is Michael Jones. I'm an economics professor here at the University of Cincinnati. I'm also a um, lead the UC on nonprofit boards initiative. And so we work with faculty and staff uh, and their service to nonprofit boards and help them uh, use their expertise at the University of Cincinnati. Personally, I'm also on a couple of boards. I used to be on the board of Sweet Cheeks Diaper Bank, and I'm currently on the board of Give Like a Mother. So when I use examples today, you'll probably hear many examples from Give Like a Mother. Hello, everyone. My name is Annie Hugenberg. I am a fourth year studying economics and marketing with a minor in environmental science. Um, Dr. Jones and I are working on a research project for an independent study this spring semester, and um, this is kind of a part of it. I'm also working on the economic landscape of nonprofits pre and post COVID. Um, and then additionally, I also had an internship in the past with um, Leadership Council for Nonprofits. I've worked closely with BOLD, if you have um, heard of that program. And then I am super involved in the students consulting for nonprofit organizations on campus. So very involved in the nonprofit world, at least as much as I can be as a college student. So I'm excited for this um, presentation and hoping to hear a lot of questions. All right, so, so let's just go ahead and get into it. If you are at a browser, uh, you can go ahead and go to this website, which is up here. You can see it's called chat.openai.com. So if you go to, to chat.openai.com, and again, there's two versions. There's the, the free version in which you'll sign up with your Gmail account or any other login that you'll create. And then there's also that premium version. It's a very simple interface to use. And the best way to think about chat GPT is that it is predictive text. You can ask it questions, any type of questions, and it's going to give you a response. And so just to get started, we can even just ask it right away, what is ChatGPT? And so when we type that in, it's going to think about it, and you can see what it actually responds. It says it's this language model created by OpenAI, that's the company, and it's designed to understand natural language and generate responses to questions and prompts, just like we're going to do here. And what it does is it's a type of artificial intelligence in that it's trained on a massive data set. And what we can ask it, what is the data set that chat GPT uses? And it'll, again, tell us exactly how it's able to answer those questions. It essentially crawls the internet, archives the internet, collects web pages, billions of words, and it uses that information to generate accurate and relevant responses to user input. So you can see this type of engagement, this, this interaction between the tool. And one way to think about it is it's very similar to if you have Gmail and it's a little creepy when you start typing in an email in Gmail and then it will leave some room and it'll auto-complete your sentences. 
That's the type of technology that this uses. So you'll see this in Gmail. You might see this in other types of autocomplete tools in which it kind of knows the way you talk, knows the way that you respond to your emails and will autocomplete it for you. And so this is an example. I'm asking it what it does. And let's just get right into like an interactive uh, example. So for example, I have a, a, a child who's visually impaired. And a couple of weeks ago, we went to Perfect North and Perfect North partners with Cincinnati Children's to do adaptive skiing. And with adaptive skiing, it helps children who are, again, blind or visually impaired. There's a lot of uh, instructors that come alongside and help them to ski. So I might, if I'm Cincinnati Children's, want to invite many of my uh, parents to, to attend this event. So I can use ChatGPT to help me create a invitation letter to this particular event. So in the text prompt here, I'm going to say write a one page letter from Cincinnati Children's to invite parents to bring their children. And I want to be as descriptive as I can because it's going to help ChatGPT generate uh, the, the response. So who have visual impairment to a day of adaptive skiing at Perfect North in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. So that's a prompt. And I'm going to go ahead and enter and watch what happens. And so remember what this tool is doing. It's got billions of words. It's got billions of documents that are out there that it's collecting them. And based on how people have responded in the past, it's responding to the input that I prompted. And then it's generating this letter here. And so now a couple observations. Uh, first of all, it does a, a pretty nice job. It says, we're excited to invite you and your children who have visual impairments to a day of adaptive skiing at Perfect North. And so you can, you can read that. Uh, now this, here, here's a couple of, of caveats. We're going to start to talk about the limitations of it. You do, do not ever want to just print out, cut, cut, and copy the output and just put it in your document because I never mentioned anything about the U.S. Association of Blind Athletes. Again, it's kind of going out and getting this information from the web. Often that, I, I assume, Association of Blind Athletes are, are very involved with the uh, adaptive skiing, but obviously we might want to take that out. And again, they, they made up this date. This event will take place on March 12th. So uh, you'll obviously want to go through and edit this, but it does a really nice job of providing this one page letter uh, of, of how you can modify and adapt this and then use this for inviting participants to uh, any kind of fundraising events or program activities uh, or things like that. So I would encourage you just to take a second if you can to, to log into that and for your nonprofit organization, you can go ahead and do something very similar. And I can change it. I know we have, I think somebody registered from Free Store Food Bank. So I can, uh, again, say write a one page letter from Free Store, uh, Free Store Food Bank about an upcoming um, canned food drive. And again, there we go. Now, one of the things that's nice about this particular tool is that as you start to interact with it, it actually understands uh, what types of information that you want to include and what types of information that you don't want to include. So what I can do is I can tweak this a little bit and it might say something like, I'm going to use the, the organization uh, GLAM, the Give Like a Mother, which I'm on board. So I'll say, write an invitation for an upcoming clothing drive. On, and I'm going to be specific. So if I tell it on March 19th, it's, no, it's going to know to include that date in the letter. So on March 19th, for the nonprofit organization, Give Like a Mother. So I'm going to type that in. And it's going to do that. Now I can change the tone. So you might say, well, well, how is it deciding what language to use? It's using based on what people most likely are to use when they write these types of letters. But if, for example, let's say, I wanna make it in the tone of a teenager. Right, you might say, I want to send this letter to, to teenagers to help them uh, participate in this activity. 
So I'm going to change this a little bit. I want to say write an invitation in the tone of a teenager for an upcoming clothing drive on March 19th. Same information. But watch so what most happens. Of the, most of the time, you don't have to repeat your question if you just want to edit it. So if you just say, like, write an invitation or add it in the tone of a teenager, it'll still take the information that you used above and know that that's what you wanted to say. That's a great point, Annie. So if you look at this, it changes it to say, hey, everyone, right? Are you tired of staring at your closet oh, wow. everywhere? So, so, but wait, there's more. <laughs> You'll get first dibs on our free snacks. Hang out with awesome people, right? Hit us up at this event. So, Andy, great point. So, let's say this. Modify uh, the letter to be in the tone of an Australian. Let's do something fun. <laughs> we need your help to make it a ripper of our success. Finally, you can give your new clobber a new lease on life. So, so very, very powerful tool uh, to help you as you're drafting communication with your volunteers, as you're drafting communication with your donors, as you're drafting communication with the community. Uh, you can see how easy this is. Go over again, for those that may have missed it, like how do you um, log in? Uh, like you said, it was a, a, a service you need to pay for or what? Can, um... Yeah, so let me log out. You can also see my screen here. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm going to log out and you can start from, from the beginning here. So if you go to chat.openai.com, just chat.openai.com, go ahead and hit enter, and you're, you should see this screen. You can log in with your OpenAI account to continue, or you can click sign up. In my case, I've already got an account, so I'm going to click log in. And you can see here where you can continue with Google, your Microsoft account, you can sign up for an account. I've set it up with Google, so I want to get to go ahead and continue with Google. All right, so it's, it's going to log me in here. And then it should take you to a screen like this. Okay. If it's, yeah, if it's free, you're not going to see the chat GPT plus, you're just going to see the chat GPT. And, and I will say it might be a lot slower for you as well if you're not paying for the premium version. There's, there's huge demand for this right now. One of the things that I would, I would share is that in just five days, ChatGPT got to 1 million users. Wow. And to put that, in, put that in context, Instagram took two and a half months to get to 1 million users. Spotify was five months. Twitter was two years. Netflix was three and a half years. So it took just five days to get to 1 million users. And it, and it got to 100 million users in just two months which is, again, just incredible. Uh, Instagram took 30 months to get to 100 million users. You know, Uber took 70 months. So the fact that you're seeing just this incredible uh, rush to use this service, I think shows the demand and the potential for it. There's also a lot of times when you log on if you don't have the plus version, as I do not, um, and it might say we're at capacity. Um, I've kind of found, you can put your name on the waiting list. I've found that if you continually refresh at the top of your screen, you have more success in just trying to get in in that moment versus if you don't do that, then you kind of are on the waiting list for a very long time. So don't be discouraged if that happens, just keep on logging in and refreshing. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so let me give you another example of again how powerful this tool is. So uh, ChatGPT is about text, it's about predictive text and finishing the prompts that you give it. You can also do the same thing with art and so let me, let me give you an example. I, I'm going to go back to that um, upcoming adaptive skiing event at Perfect North. And St. Bernard's are dogs that uh, are, are trained to help um, uh, be rescue dogs. So what I can do, I can do something very similar. And this is, uh, you can go to labs.openai.com as well if you want to try this out. And I can ask it to do a St. Bernard snow skiing. And I can tell it to do it as an oil painting. So again, the same type of idea where I'm prompting the, uh, the tool. So now it's thinking, all right? So it's, this is gonna take a little bit more time because it's gotta generate a picture, but you can see examples. 
right, of things that it does. And look at that. Hmm. Like it creates, and I might want to use one of these for the image for the invitation letter. Now they're not great. So I set it as an oil painting, but I can change it to be as an impression, impressionist painting. So again, it's going to think about it again. And we'll give it just a second to work. And if I'm going with teenagers, maybe I don't want an impressionist painting. Maybe I want something like pixel art. So here's the impressionist painting. All right, so, so, so pretty cool. And again, what, what it's doing is it's going out to that massive database of data that it has, and it's pulling in what you tell, it's pulling in what you're telling it, and it knows what an impressionist painting looks like, and it's modifying that. So what if I want instead a golden retriever skiing, and I want to do it as pixel art? So I want to make it a little more fun. So again, it's going to think. It's going to go to its database figure out what golden retrievers look like. And it knows what pixel art looks like. And we'll see what it comes up with. So can you see that? Can you see the golden retrievers? I can guess kind of pixel art. So I might use this again as a tool if I'm a nonprofit a program manager or you know a, a, someone who needs to constantly create new tools of communication. I can use this tool, Dolly, which is uh, a, a generative art tool. These are all types of tools that are in that uh, genre of generative AI or generative artificial intelligence. And what it does, again, is it takes massive amounts of data and predicts what would be the most likely outcome of the text that you give it. So now you can see I've started at you know, 15 minutes ago. If I go back to my chat, let me, let me go back to what it was, write an invitation. I think I have to start over now. For for um, what did I say? Write a, write a one page. We'll come back to this. So you can see in just a period of, of of ten to fifteen minutes, I can create a nice one page letter that I can send out. So so that's the first way of thinking about Chat GPT as a tool, is that it does content generation for you. The second thing I want to take away is you can take the same type of content and you can have it break it up into different use cases. So if you've got a social media team or maybe it's just you, you're the solo executive director and you're managing your, your communication strategy and, and your social media presence with Twitter, I can say, um, you know, modify the letter above in a series of five tweets. So, so look how nice this is. So now I can plan out my social media strategy. Series of five tweets. It adds the hashtags to it. It makes sure it's not longer than the number of characters provided in Twitter. A couple other things that you can do. If you can see my screen, you see this thumbs up and thumbs down. The, the software learns from you. So if you give it feedback and say, I don't like this or... Um, I, I really like the way you, you created this prompt. I can put thumbs up and thumbs down. And so it will create new types of content when you ask it again. I can also just regenerate the response. So I'll hit regenerate the response again. And now it adds a little emoji there. So it's a little bit different. So this might be a little more appropriate again, if you wanna be uh, reaching out to a different audience with emojis, it will do the same content same exact prompt, but now we'll give you different outputs, different hashtags. And notice if you just tweak it just a little bit, I, I, can, I can maybe say something like um, create five um, compelling tweets on the, uh, or, or, or tweets to, as a call of action, create five tweets to be a call to action for the upcoming event, right? I can just, I can keep going back and forth, calling all families. Do you have it? And so this is sort of right again, taking that feedback that we want you to go do something. Okay. Another important use case could be like inputting what um, content you already have 
and then asking it to create further in the same tone or with the information that you give it. So if you wanted to, you could input someone's, you're already like your Twitter account, say so using my Twitter account and like put your handle in, it would be able to generate like um, information regarding whatever you've already posted to create a new tweet, um, which is really useful in terms of, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, in terms of if you want to write an offer letter or something along those lines. Any questions about this? I think these are all types of, of fair game uses for chat GPT. And, and the way I think about it as a tool, it's, it's a force multiplier. It, it really takes the, the, the type of work that you would already be doing and you could do it in such a quick period of time often when you write content for even as a you know professor and you're writing new slides or paper like the first draft is often the hardest it's really hard to get that first draft out but but i can actually tell it the number of words and things i want to do i'll just i'll, cl I'll close with this example here before we move on i can even tell it to write a 500 word thought leadership piece so let, let's start with this write a 500 word <laughs> thought leadership piece on the importance of teenagers wearing stylish clothing. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to write the article as the executive director of, again, Give Like a Mother, uh, which is, I want to give it some more details, which is a nonprofit that provides local children with local children and teens with seasonally appropriate clothing. All right. So I've given it a pretty good prompt. And now I'm, I'm, I'm telling it to do 500 words. So maybe you've got an op-ed. You want to put something in the Inquirer, something in the business courier. Now, a couple of things that you'll notice when you do this, you don't know where this data comes from. You don't know where these, these words come from. So some of the things you'll see, so let's, let's let it finish. It's going to take its 500 words. Uh, for example, let's see, it says research shows that when students feel good about their appearance, they're more likely to participate in class, engage with peers, and perform better academically. So we, we just know that that's given us text. We can't actually get the sources yet. I think one of the things that you'll see over time as this tool improves is that it's going to start to actually pull in citations for this. Uh, that becomes very, very powerful when you can start to see exactly where some of this data is coming from. Julie, to answer your question around ethical issues, and this is kind of a discussion, I think, but um, I know in the educational field, it's an issue with students. Like if I were to have an assignment that was to write a 500 word essay, um, it's pulling, I mean, granted, I haven't tried this, but I'm assuming um, that it's pulling words from what's already out there. So that would definitely get kind of tricky on the, um, just making sure that you're not copying other people's works. Um, but at the same time, like if you are writing it, you can pull different, I think that it's super valuable for like pulling different phrases. Um, say like, okay, well this would work really well for what I'm trying to communicate here. So again, I know we said earlier that we always wanna double check and never just copy and paste anything. Um, and this will be a really good experience um, example as well, but you always want to make sure that you're reading again what you're writing out um, and making it as authentic to you as possible, but maybe having a little bit of support when you're understaffed or you're in a little bit of a writer's block. There's not. Um, in fact, it's I, I've done it before. Uh, students, when you write letters of recommendation, they say, um, obviously, you ask for their CV, maybe their um, statement of purpose, like any information. I've cut and paste that whole thing just right in there, and it will draft a letter of recommendation. Um, and let me let me give you an example of that, uh, Christy. So one kind of uses to move on. Let me. There's one more question though. Let me make sure I answer that. Um, we talked about the ethical issues. Somebody texted me and said, is there an easy way to detect if something is written by chat GPT versus an individual? Um, there are, it's like a, uh, it's like a battle, you know, there's a warfare, somebody comes out with a new tool, then somebody comes out with a way to, um, you know, um, fight back against that tool. There are tools out there that are being developed. I've tried them. They're okay. Um, but that can see if, if the software is written 
uh, or if the prompt is written by chat GPT, the challenge is that you can modify um, the text by one or two words and it'll give you something very different. And, and Todd Foley has a great point here. Uh, Todd, who's also a colleague here at the University of Cincinnati, mentions that it is trained on actual text and it can copy word for word someone else's work and it won't tell you. And it also makes stuff up, right? So Todd brings up a very good point about, um, you know, this is just a tool. It, it can absolutely copy word for word. You don't know the citations. And so there's a lot of debate obviously going on right now in the educational uh, field about how to, to handle these, these situations. Um, let, me, let me give you an example um, of how you can cut and paste just massive amounts of text. So I'm going to go back to my example. Uh, this, this happened pretty recently. We, we, we are looking to hire an individual at Give Like a Mother. And so I was like, well, let's, let's, let's play around with this. Let's, let's see how well it does. So we can write a job offer letter to Michael Jones, the new director of development at Give Like a Mother. So does a pretty decent job, a lot of information. Again, you can kind of see it's pulling from the, from the text. Often directors of development work closely with executive directors and even board of, or, uh, board of directors. Um, but uh, there may be elements that I'm, I'm not including that I should. So there's a web source, a, a website, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, uh, where you can get great information about um, uh, nonprofit governance and management board source. So board source actually has a website where they say, these are all the things that you should include in a contract. So I'm actually going to cut and paste this information. This is from the website. So if you see this here, I've now said, please include the following elements, all right? So making sure the job offer letter includes terms of the contract, job description, starting salary, right? All these things. And now I want to put this in there. So it's going to modify this. All the things I just told it to include, salary adjustment terms, incentive plans, evaluations, retirement, deferred compensation, right, reimbursement. So all these things I told it to do, it modifies it a bit, confidentiality clauses. One, again, one caveat here though, is that I think a lot of these use cases that we've done so far are, are, are fair game in terms of creating content for newsletters or fundraising. When you start getting into, obviously these are legal issues, I would certainly be very, very cautious. Um, you know, the, the same rules apply. Run this by your legal counsel. Um, uh, make sure that you're not doing anything that would, if, if certain things have to be included in a job offer letter, if you're in a state that spells out certain things, um, you know, it is not smart enough to know that I'm in the state of Michigan or California where non-compete clauses aren't applicable, right? So that, that might be an example of, again, do your due diligence it gets you the first draft, uh, but you need to make sure that uh, you're running this by um, the right folks. Um, keep reading the comments. Nadia has a great point here. Um, give it the original content, uh, like the resume, job description, and then not the internet. So that's a great point, Nadia. Over time, when you start to use this, uh, the tool will respond to your prompts, your inputs, and you can have it use the data that you feed it. Um, and again, Nadia, thank you. There's still lots of room for errors and plagiarism. What is liking or disliking the text that is generated do? So again, on the, on the side, you can see that there's these thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, if you don't like that particular way of phrasing, if you put the thumbs down, it will know next time when it generates prompts not to use that type of language. It will modify it and use it a bit different type of language. Karen, in terms of grant writing, I think the best way to go about that would be as inputting as much information as possible and altering it like I've done examples where this is on a different side but like I use it to help me be able to code um, information and the more information I give it that I want the best results that it has and it takes a couple like attempts to kind of get the best result out of it um, and I've definitely gone in a little circle sometimes where I'm like, okay, I need to actually figure this out some other way, maybe because it can't, it isn't perfect. But again, another important thing is, is making sure that you're not, um, plagiarizing, but it would definitely be something to have a starting point for your writing. 
So we, we've kind of started to talk about the limitations. Um, I want to move on to be more explicit about what these limitations are. Okay, a couple other comments is that this is just one tool. This was really the first that came out that was uh, widely adopted. It's going to have many competitors. Uh, you already read about tools from Google. Uh, Google Bard uh, is going to be released shortly for the public use. Meta, they have their own tool called Llama that they're starting to work uh, for release. So you can imagine how powerful this tool is. And frankly, $20 a month, that that's that's nothing, you know. That's that's easy justification to pay for. When I can create a first draft of something, or if I'm, you know, Karen, you mentioned grant writing. I mean, it, it can create a, a two thousand word, um, again, maybe piece on the importance of why kids need, uh, uh, you know, seasonally appropriate stylish clothing. Uh, that's worth twenty dollars a month. And so I think what you're going to start to see is massive advancement in this space. You'll see very quickly new features. This is in the first stage, this is in the first three months, but some of the things we've already talked about, the limitations around citations of where the data comes from, I think you're going to start to see that. Um, you're going to start to see it um, not just do, you know, we've seen art, we've seen um, text, we'll see, you've seen music, there are lots of other uh, features that are going to be added. So we're still very early into this, but some of the limitations are you know, definitely garbage in, garbage out. This was Todd's comment about it is searching the internet. Uh, and we all know how much garbage there is on the internet. So Nadia's point about giving it your own text that you know is quality, that you've vetted, is, is a best practice. A lot of times you, you don't have a place to start, and so you, you still will just go with what ChatGPT gives you. But again, really keep in mind that it is garbage in, garbage out. The data is not up to date. It's not going to tell you what happened yesterday. Uh, they released these new features. They release a new version, you know, every few days, every few weeks, and they're they're updating it. But it's looking at a, a massive database in the past, and so uh, you might not have the most up to date information. So I can't say, hey, Chat GPT, what happened yesterday, or what was the weather in Cincinnati yesterday? Like it, it doesn't have that data. A couple other things is that the output can be wrong. I want to be really clear about this. There are plenty of examples on the internet, on Twitter, where people will plug in answers uh, or, or, or prompts and, and chat GPT will give the wrong answer. So things like at one point you could say, um, how many countries started with the letter V? And it couldn't do that. Right? It actually said there are zero countries that start with the letter V. And so over time they fixed those. And as this tool gets used by many more people, the uh, it's always evolving and always updating it, but it is not a computational tool. It uh, So it's not a math tool. There's other tools out there that if you want it to solve math problems or logic problems, uh, there are other computational tools. This is a text tool. So it looks at a database of texts and words. Still does a phenomenal job, but know those limitations. Couple other points I just want to mention: output absolutely can be biased. Some of the ethical issues there that we're aware of uh, that have been mentioned before. One was plagiarism. The other is that again, it's just looking at text that's on the internet. So be very careful. It may make stereotypes. Um, for example, it didn't do it this time, but when I was preparing for this presentation, I typed in the invitation letter uh, and uh, for the the skiing event for adaptive skiing, and it said. Um, please bring all um, visually impaired children to the event. Um, well, that's necessarily wrong, but uh, it's nicer to say they're still children first. So, you know, please bring your children who have visual impairments. Um, so making sure that you're editing the content, the words uh, when it comes out. The last thing I would say is it can be impersonal. I'll just share this one example before we pause here for a second. Uh, this got some attention just a couple of weeks ago here in our uh, industry of higher education, there were some administrators who sent out an email in response to the shooting on Michigan State. And for whatever reason, they decided to have ChatGPT generate that. And they uh, were, uh, the, of course this was found out because it said it was generated by ChatGPT. And so it, it blew up in the news. Um, it's also, the, I think the administrators were sort of, um, they were um, 
uh, they weren't fired, but I think they were put on administrative leave for a period of time. So it does bring up some really interesting uh, questions. I see there's some chat, so maybe I'll yeah. pause here. What are your thoughts on creating a skepticism on anything you read? This is actually very scary in some sense technology, because I think what it does is you really start to question everything and you should question everything. Um, how do I know that this content came from the person who wrote it? Huge issues, obviously, in education. How do you know that this 500 word essay was written by a student? Um, how do I know that the content is not fake? Right? There's, we've, we've seen all of the, the fake news and, and uh, the, the discussion about um, conspiracies. So this only amplifies, I think, that discussion. And it's certainly, uh, somebody mentions that it's a paradox that the tool may be too powerful for its own good. I think you should absolutely be skeptical. Um, it is very helpful for initial drafts, as you said, but the proofing, the fact checking, notice the skill set that's, that's having to change now. Um, I tell students this, it used to be that you really had to be a good coder. Um, you had to be able to, to, to work with uh, uh, programming to, to do some of these things, but anymore, you can actually have chat GPT do some of the stuff for you. And so the skills now are having critical thinking, um, uh, being having a, that skeptical mindset and really about data synthesis, putting it together now. And it's not just about uh, going out and doing the tools. Okay, so I can actually generate code. I can use chat GPT to generate programming code to do certain types of tasks and activities. Next month, Christy, we've been working with Christy and, and other organizations to put together a nonprofit economic outlook event where we pull in data on the nonprofit sector, like what's happening in terms of um, contributions, new organizations that have been started, et cetera. So I can actually, um, and, and I'm not gonna do this, I just, just for the sake of time. If you go to the IRS website, so I can click on, if I go to the IRS website here, there is a, a CSV file, so a spreadsheet in which I can download all of the data about nonprofit organizations. So if you're a nonprofit, you know that every year you file a 990, you put in information about the number of employees, assets, revenue, et cetera. Uh, you can, it's actually pretty hard to do some of the analysis. So three years ago, I would have to write code. Um, I would have to download the data and you can kind of see here some of this code. It's not Difficult, but you have to understand kind of what's happening. But I can have ChatGPT tell me exactly what to do, how it's stored, and it'll print the first few rows of the data and do it for me. So I can do things, and again, we don't we don't really have the time to do this. But notice I'm telling the ChatGPT what to do in words. So I'm telling it, hey, keep only that data in which the city is equal to Cincinnati. The, uh, the NTE code, these are codes, how you classify nonprofit organizations. I can tell it to sort organizations. All right, so I can, I can tell it what to do. Keep only the name and the income amount of the, of the largest observations. And now when you scroll down here, look at this. It's telling me exactly the code of what to do. And I can just plop that into my, um, my, my programming application and it will do just that. And I can say, create a graph, right? So create a bar chart of this information. So kind of last, last thing I can do. So it's gonna modify it. It's gonna right, pull in the URL, filter all the data, do what I say. And then last thing here, it's gonna create a bar chart of the top 10 organizations sorted by income. And I'm done. So, so sorry. just to verify this, so you don't actually ask ChatGPT to um, to give you like when we spoke, um, you talked about how oh well, you can get um, you know look within a you know in Cincinnati and see how many uh, nonprofits have food in their mission statement, so that I would be able to pull up all the the, the nonprofits that that have um, or dealing with food insecurity. So. You're, you're saying that it would give me the code to go do that yet at a different site. It's not actually returning that kind of data. It's returning text. That's correct. So, so that's a great point, Christy. Like it's not that smart yet, um, <laughs> but it's getting really close because it's creating the code. I still have to run this. Um, 
So you're right. It's not like it's not jumping straight to the point of just generate a top 10 list. Although let, let me share something with you. So there's some really cool functionality. This came out uh, earlier this week. I saw somebody do this on, on, on TikTok. So there are functions where you can embed this straight in Google or Word. So, so notice here, I'm actually calling chat GPT as a function in Google spreadsheet. So it says equals GPT underscore table, get a list of the five largest for-profit organizations in Cincinnati, as well as their CEOs. So what's happening here is I'm passing that text. It's passing that on to chat GPT and it's, and it's running that. Let's see, my, where's my extensions? Here we go. Let me make sure I enable it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to enable these functions. I can start to embed this functionality straight into chat GPT or into uh, spreadsheets and Word. So and it's, is it's, that functionality for Google or it's also available in Excel? It's uh, this particular one's available in, Ex in Google, um, but you can call this in other functionalities as well. I believe if there's not already an extension released, um, there should be one shortly. All right, so it's, wow. it's taking a second, but what it will do is it will actually, within this table, it will print off those five organizations as well as their, CP, as well as their CEO. So let me just do the nonprofit. It's taking a second. I'll come back to that so you can see it. Hopefully it does it soon. But it's, it's, it's really in, in, incredible, the functionality that's being built in. There it is. So look at that. Uh, and so, sorry, so the functions GPT table is looking into what's the database that it's looking into right now? Great point. So it, so so see within this function, it's passing this parameter, this text. It's yeah. passing it. This is a, it's, it's an API. So it's passing that string of text into Chat GPT's API, and Chat GPT is spitting back out this functionality or these this output. So normally, Chat GPT's output goes into the text right, which you see here, but you can also have it spit out that text into uh, Word or Excel. And so that's what it's, you're, you're seeing there. And I could change it to be the, the largest, right, for-profit organizations in Cincinnati, right? I run this again, it's passing that same text and it's gonna spit it back out to me in a table. So if you're, a, a, again, a fundraiser or uh, just trying to keep track of database and researcher, right? Here's, a, here's the biggest one. There's Taylor, Procter & Gamble. Now, earlier, Todd Foley made the point that this data is only good up to 2021. So look at yeah. this, right? So Fifth Third, it says it's Greg Carmichael. He's not the CEO anymore. And David Taylor is not the CEO anymore at PNG. Yeah, so this, this, this data is a little bit old, but... Again, you can see in six months when they start releasing new updates on a daily basis, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be a, just so, a game. Sorry, let, let, I'm, I'm on the slow learners group today. <laughs> let me go back to make sure I understood what you just did. So, or, or what the command does. Oh, what the command does here? To, yeah, it go, yeah. Goes to GPT table, goes to GPT, types this into uh, the the... the uh, whatever into the tool, into the GPT tool, yeah, and then brings back whatever Chat GPT told me. Correct, that's correct. And so you just have to be logged into both at, the th at that time. Yeah, essentially, what you do is um, you you actually have to buy this. A it's called an API key, and so what it does is it doesn't want a hundred million people all hitting their servers. This is very computationally intensive, so you pay for this. When I pay the twenty dollars, oh, okay. when I pay the twenty dollars a month, I get this API key that allows me to access Chat GPT servers, and I can just pass anything back and forth to it. If I try to do more than, um, like, there's a limit. If I do the twenty five largest, I don't think it does it because it only lets you do like twenty queries a minute. Um, we'll see what it does, but 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 it's definitely putting limitations on what you can and can't do. Like to do this by hand, you would have to go to oh, chat go. GPT, get the get the information, and then copy paste into Excel. Correct. You could do that. Yeah, if you wanted to do that. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I'm surprised Microsoft doesn't try to stop Google from doing this. So actually, um, OpenAI is invested in by Microsoft. So Microsoft is in implementing the same technology into its Bing search engine. So, uh, so Robert, yeah, the they all want to try to develop their own. This is the next generation of of search. And so all these companies from from Microsoft to Apple to you know Meta, they're going to be constantly trying to one up the features that they offer to their users. And and yes, they're going to want to try to integrate this technology into their own platforms, right? Buy Microsoft Office, buy Microsoft Excel, so you can in, embed this functionality in your in your tools. We have about five minutes left, so I want to be respectful of time. I think you, this is just like a teaser of what you can do with it. Annie, do you want to add anything else on your end? Yeah, well, I think um, I, earlier we showed that the R coding and the R, to, R is a like free programming um, that I took one course in, um, and I now can use ChatGPT to help me really do so much more um, for this research project that I discussed earlier about the economic landscape um, of nonprofits in Cincinnati. So it's been really awesome. Like you can put your code in, copy and paste it. You can, there's a, literally a copy button that you just have to press and then put it right into your coding program. And then if you get results that are, um, if you have an error, you I just tend to copy and paste whatever my error was and put it back in there. And then it'll, and I'll say, why did this happen? Can you give me new code? And then it gives me an entire um, new code with adjusting to the errors that I had. Or it tells me why um, they can't really fix it. So then I have to go in and do some more research or figure out what to do next. So it definitely is like the calculator like you can't do it all but if you have any basic skills or are interested in learning um about that it can be extremely helpful um to that and then I'm excited also I know that we said this a couple times but the presentation in April will really focus on um what we found through this research with the help of chat GBT. I also just dropped my email in the in the uh, chat there, so more than happy to continue the conversation. I am I am not an expert on this. Um, I'm just uh, a professor who's adopted it and started to use it in its class and in the tools. But I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you have more about them. <laughs>